my dear students welcome to this edition of uh, vbs anatoma a series of uh, e learning videos of lectures in gross anatomy we are now covering the head and neck region of which very specifically today's lecture will be paranasal sinus 2 the frontal sinus earlier we have covered the maxillary sinus in detail today we will cover the next sinus the frontal sinus next when you when you look at nature there is a built in element of ornamentation uh, especially in the region of the head as you can see in this case the peacock you see some kind of a plume or some kind of a ornamentation is is there so also in the other photograph the degree varies but certainly it is there in some birds nothing is there we do not know it may be for various uh, scientific reasons but then when you look at humans surely there is something uh, interesting here also it may be even a simple band of flowers as shown here or it may be uh, a tiara in a contest or uh, for a wedding or it may even be the royalty using more sophisticated versions of uh, the crown well it could be symbolic it could be a protection it could be a cosmetic or it could be an ornamentation what we are now beginning to see is there is extensive utility of some kind of an ornamentation in the region of the forehead okay but then we'll be surprised to know that there is a beautiful crown inside the forehead and today's discussion is going to be on that the frontal sinus location and orientation of the frontal sinus let's start with the supra orbital margin that is the sharp margin right at the upper border of the orbital cavity but then that's not our focus right above that is an elevation that's the super ciliary arch the frontal sinus that we are going to discuss today is located deep inside the super ciliary arch in other words the super ciliary arch and the median glabella in between are rough indications of the location of the frontal and the frontal sinus may extend above uh, or a little laterally but these two landmarks namely the two superciliary arches and the glabella will give you a rough indication of the location of the uh, <coughs> arch of the um, uh, frontal sinus now you see to get the sinus seen in best view a skull like this would probably be the most uh, uh, ideal here what we have done is uh, very very carefully we have removed only the outer table of the skull we have reflected the outer table bone and you can also now see the inner table and more importantly on the uh, this thing is the beautiful um, tiara or the frontal sinus some part of it is also there on the outer table uh, because it's a it's a cavity between the two uh, tables so that's what i meant here is a beautiful uh, ornamentation uh, deep within us now let's see this sinus in in more detail it's a crown like uh, area uh, as shown earlier it has lot of septa but uh, except for one which will be a central septum separating the two sinuses the rest of the septa are incomplete in fact even the central sulcus uh, sorry in the central septa may also be incomplete so as to give continuity between the two uh, sinuses but when you look at the lower part of the sinus you will see there is a small uh, pit like area when traced down with a pin or uh, or a, uh, a pointer it will lead into the nasal cavity 
where in the nasal cavity we will we will discuss a little in detail in the next few slides next here is a dry skull it's a sagittal section this is just to get a better orientation you can see the frontal sign is very clearly there pointed with the label outer table is thicker and it is in the front part of the sinus anterior wall of the sinus a relatively thinner inner table i mean both the walls are reasonably good but then between the two the anterior is thick the posterior is thinner next you can see the prominence of the superciliary arch and how it's closely related to the uh, front ear sinus remember over and above what i am showing there is a cloth of mucous membrane uh, on the interior lined by pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium that's a, that's a very important point and of course some secretory glands will be there mucous and serous glands here is a, the sagittal section a little more in detail first note the frontal sinus location the label is still there immediately behind the posterior plate of the frontal sinus or the posterior wall of the frontal sinus is the anterior cranial fossa remember that's very very important the other label lower down is the frontal sinus opening into the infundibulum infundibulum is a funnel shaped area traced downwards it it goes into a region in front and below the ethmoidal bulla that is it, it it slides the infundibulum trace down goes towards the hiatus semilunaris and finally uh, the in, in summary the frontal sinus technically opens into the middle meatus may not be the, exactly like this uh, sometimes the frontal sinus is found to have some variability particularly it may open into the anterior ethmoidal layer cells uh, or it may open into a the the maxillary sinus uh, directly some interesting variabilities could be possible when you look at the blood supply of the frontal sinus remember it is not the arterial supply that's very important well it is there already the supraorbital and supratrochlear vessels but it is the venous drainage that is more important i don't mean you know the part where it goes into the uh, angular vein well that is also there that is of morphological importance but what is more important is the veins among other areas of drainage drain through the posterior wall of the frontal sinus into the uh, cranial cavity now this is through diploic veins there are minute foramina on the posterior wall through which these tiny diploic veins establish kind of communication or the flow of blood into the cranial cavity now this is dangerous i am sure we have talked about the danger area of the face in a discussion on the cavernous sinus something similar if not as extreme uh, has to be uh, considered here also um, now these diploic veins are tiny veins but they they can carry infection that means even a small simple uh, frontal sinusitis you cannot ignore it you have to be careful because of the scope for spread of infection intracranially it could lead to meningitis and other uh, related complications now that's what i meant by the uh, blood supply next we although this is all in terms of anatomy of the frontal sinus it's a simple uh, crown like uh, space with incomplete septa apex is superior base is lower down and in the base there is a small cup like area which uh, goes down into the infundibulum and it is drained into the um, middle meatus fortunately gravity aided drainage helps in removal of secretions uh, from the frontal sinus into the nasal cavity but then in spite of it the the frontal sinus can get blocked that area i told you just above the infundibulum there can be a mucus plug or there can be some uh, kind of very heavy infection not routinely manageable with antibiotics some such possibilities are there blockage leading to accumulation of secretions that further uh, causing a very severe uh, 
pain in the front region or some of the uh, possibilities you will encounter in the ENT practice. Therefore, I would like to take a uh, panoramic tour of some important clinical aspects which has a bearing on the anatomical knowledge that you are currently pursuing. Now, as I told you, the frontal sinus infections, even if trivial, has to be looked into with utmost seriousness. One, it can go into the intracranial uh, area as already mentioned. Two, you will notice that uh, in, in more severe cases, uh, it can down uh, this, this is photograph is to show how close the dura mater is to the posterior wall of the frontal sinus and that shining star is to say there is hardly any gap. It is virtually plastered. As a result, you have to be very, very careful. Now, fronto orbital spread. See, once the mucosa are in continuity and if there is either an infection or more probably a trauma, it is likely that the infection can spread into the orbit resulting in orbital cellulitis. The immediate uh, uh, muscles may uh, be involved uh, and uh, the, there may be ocular symptoms of an otherwise a simple uh, fascia, frontal sinus infection. This is possible. In other words, slowly we are beginning to realize the sinus itself may, is, is quite uh, simple in terms of knowledge and uh, design. But the vicinity in which it is located, the strategic position in which it is located makes it uh, uh, really, really uh, calling for attention clinically. Similarly, just like fronto orbital spread, it could even touch the ethmoid. Uh, that, that is to say, uh, in the event of uh, injuries in the frontal region, particularly in road traffic accidents, this is why we say wear a helmet. It is for your own safety. Next, this could also be a fronto ethmoidal spread in the event of uh, uh, trauma, the fracture or the lesion may crack through the cribriform plate and a simple sinus, sinus uh, uh, problem um, or a, 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 an injury in the frontal sinus by touching the cribriform plate uh, or anywhere in the posterior wall may actually allow CSF leakage into the nasal cavity. That's why I have put the possibility of CSF rhinorrhea as one of the um, possibilities in a frontal sinus uh, injury. Now, you see, slowly I'm shifting from the word uh, infection to trauma or injury because one is simple viral or a bacterial or a fungal infection. Okay. Second is trauma either alone uh, in the frontal sinus, which is possible, road traffic accidents and other traffic accidents. Yes, it could also involve neighboring structures. So it may be along with uh, the cribriform plate injury or as yes, part of the ethmoid bone injury. Now, CSF rhinorrhea is one of the possibili possibilities, one of the possible manifestations of a, fr a frontal sinus infection. <laughs> Remember, those fractures which I talked of, or the, sometimes it could be simple, it could be comminuted, uh, you know, it could be involving only the anterior wall, it could be involving only the posterior wall, or it could be comminuted where, you know, both the anterior and the posterior wall are cracked into multiple bits. These are all some of the possibilities. Now, besides local uh, bleeding, well, there could be hematoma formation, no doubt and accumulation of secretions, and pus, mucus, all these uh, routine complications could be there. But sometimes it could even cause cosmetic damage and collapse of the frontal uh, plate. Uh, as a result, uh, there may be some disfiguration which may call for some kind of a plastic surgery, uh, you know, intervention. See, in other words, what we started as a very, very simple sinus in terms of anatomy is becoming more and more you know, is appearing more and more dangerous primarily because of the important structures in its immediate vicinity, most important of which is the uh, interior of the cranial cavity right behind and the orbit uh, 
uh, immediately below and lateral to it. Next, as I told you, it's more common that uh, the frontal sinus injuries, uh, fractures, tears, laceration, generally they, they accompany overall injury of the face. So it, it, it becomes a component of the facio maxillary injuries. Let's, let's say for example, uh, in, a, in a motor car, you hit your face very dramatically on the steering wheel and there is a huge uh, uh, hit fracture, number of facial bones are involved. Well, possible that the uh, frontal sinus uh, walls are also involved. This is how you look at it. Now, this is uh, this may not be any any kind of a injury or an infection. This is an incidental uh, finding. Normally, uh, and I am just presenting it because I could get a specimen of this type. Normally, we say the frontal sinus is located in the uh, frontal bone, the vertical part of the frontal bone. But books did give that you know a small part of it can actually extend into the orbital plate of the frontal bone and this is exactly what is happening uh, in this uh, uh, specimen. So I have shown not only the frontal sinus, I have shown the extension of the frontal sinus posteriorly into the orbital plate of the uh, frontal bone. This is unusual. In other words, you have a piece of frontal bone uh, in the roof of the orbital cavity. Now, these are an interesting variants you, have, you may have to remember. This may be of use when you use an endoscope and things like that. Uh, one point I, I would like to discuss in this slide is there are, see basically we use antibiotics, we use uh, nasal decongestants, we, we advise the patient of uh, uh, steam inhalation. All these conservative methods are initially tried to control sinusitis, whether it is maxillary or the frontal sinusitis or whatever. But sometimes, you know, there may be need for surgical intervention in very uh, difficult cases, not responding to antibiotics and the acuteness of the inflammation is so high that by the time the patient reaches the hospital, the sinus is full and almost waiting to burst. In that stage, you have to do a surgical intervention. Fortunately, we have very powerful endoscopes which can do the thing. You can pass the endoscope from below into the uh, nasal cavity and through that reach the sinus drain. All that is possible, but but there are technical reasons. You see, I may not be. It may be beyond anatomy discussion to go into technical logistics. Your ENT surgeons will tell you there are certain reasons why the endoscopy may not be possible or it may be a failure in which case you may have to go direct trephining you know you'll have to create a burr hole open the skin remove the low you know make a small hole through the local muscles there then uh, drill a hole into the bone and release the pus this is also required that way once there is a hole available uh, you can uh, keep uh, draining the pus until the situation comes under control later on this uh, burr hole can also be closed this is uh, one possibility. Remember sometimes you know very very rare cases are there where uh, you know the frontal sinus becomes a, a perpetual nuisance as, as a as an infection point for, for whatever reason secondary to trauma or there is a um, bead of infection that just refuses to disappear with antibiotics. In which case, you know, you may have to intervene for a, for a more difficult surgical techniques. One of those well-known uh, techniques is cranialization of the frontal sinus. You know, they will remove the entire posterior wall and allow the dura to pop forwards. Once in a way, it's not a very common thing. It's, it's, it's a matter of, you know, anatomical interest. Sometimes this may also be required is what I am uh, trying to say. Next, this was a, a, a general overview of the anatomy and more than the anatomy, the clinical uh, anatomy and its relevance in the ENT practice is what I tried to highlight in this particular video. I'm sure uh, your students will have some, some doubts or clarifications. Give me a note 
on my email id as i have mentioned it here or since i am posting it in youtube there is a blog area immediately below the youtube and you, you uh, write down your queries and i will uh, answer these queries to the best of my ability so that is the uh, overall uh, summary of uh, the of anatomy of the frontal uh, sinus i hope you have uh, benefited with this uh, to get a continuous uh, information about uh, more videos being added to this channel vbs and atoma students may consider subscribing to this uh, channel thank you